when you put single Bs together, you start getting <coughs> behaviors, attributes that are otherwise missing in the individual. So let's talk more specifically about this. Social insect colonies, these superorganisms, are said to have amoeboid-like foraging patterns. So Tom Seeley did a research project years ago, and imagine yourself hovering above your honeybee colony and mapping out the foraging route of each bee that leaves the nest. On day one, he did that, and you can see the colony's foraging pattern on the left. And what you'll notice is that there are groups of bees that are reaching out to one area, exploiting it fully, and pulling those resources back into the nest. On day two, it rained. On day three, they foraged in a completely different direction, exploiting the resources north of them. So while they may have been foraging on the same species of plant, having lots of bees doing lots of things, they're able to exploit that fully in whatever area it's available that day. And so we call this an amoeboid foraging pattern because this is the same way amoeba, single cell organisms forage. They, they reach out their gelatinous, for lack of a better term, appendages, grabbing whatever prey that they have, and when they find that prey, they bring it back into the central cell to digest it. And this is how all social insects forage. They reach out with groups of bees or wasps or ants or termites, gather whatever food source is available, and they're constantly reaching in all directions, pulling things in to the center where the nest is to digest it collectively. Also unique to social insects is this idea of a communal stomach. We know that honeybees engage in a behavior called trophallaxis, where one bee, a hungry bee, antenates with a bee that has food, and that antenation requires the bee with food to regurgitate honey so that the hungry bee can just sit there and lick it up. Well, what we only appreciated in the last 50 years or so is that this antenating, this shared food, this trophallaxis, spreads food uniformly, evenly, about the nest so that food resources are being collectively digested by lots of bees simultaneously. If you radio label a little bit of sugar syrup and feed it to a few bees, it's not long before most bees in the nest have radio labeled sugar syrup in their stomachs. And that's because trophallaxis ensures this group digestion, this evenness, this distribution of resources within the colony's communal stomach. Honeybees are also one of the only or organisms on the planet to produce what we call a true food. And a true food is a food, right? It's a food that is produced by the individual that on which one of its own members can fully develop. Okay, we call that brood food or royal jelly. It's secreted by worker bees and on it, one of the life stages of a worker bee, the immature, can fully develop. There's only one other organism that produces a true food. What is it? Mammals. What is it? Milk. Milk is a true food. My wife nursed all four of our kids for the first year of their life. They grew completely on a true food, a food produced by their mother. And that's unique to honeybees and mammals. And incidentally, Jürgen Tauts, the book that was on the furthest right, argues that honeybee colonies are basically mammals. One of the most important functions of wax is it's very important in the handling of wastes in the colony. Did you know that? Now you might think that humans invented pesticides in the 1940s, but you'd be wrong. Plants have been using pesticides for a very long time, and bees have had to deal with pesticides for a very long time. So a lot of pesticides, for example, are lipophilic, which means wax-loving. When they come into the colonies, they get absorbed in the wax, and we look at pesticide residues in our wax, and we panic and freak out. But you'll realize the idea of being lipophilic means that you want to be in wax. Something that wants to be in wax doesn't want to come out. So oftentimes, the wax will hold those things away from the bees. Does that make sense? A lot of debris and pathogens might get built up in wax. 
That means that honeybee colonies are warm-blooded. Bees are cold-blooded, but colonies are warm-blooded. They're able to thermoregulate despite the ambient temperature. That's the definition of warm-blooded. That's another reason that Jeremy Talos argues that honeybee colonies are mammals. 